Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, hope you're all safe in this pandemic and excited to come back to campus. So I'm Rishit from Bits Pilani Pilani campus. And with me, I have Chetan, who is from the Goa campus. Uh, we're members of Anchor, which is the Gender and Sexuality Cell for Bits Pilani University. And we welcome you all to the second discussion of Unlearning and Learning with the Professors, which is a short series of like discussions in association with the professors of the Humanities and Social Sciences Department from Bits Pilani, Bits Goa, and Bits Hyderabad. Uh, today, we'll be talking to Dr. Madhurima Das, who has been a part of various research projects and uh, scholarship grants centered around the topics of paid domestic work, global in inequality, transnational ge uh, gender politics, and feminist issues. And she has been awarded numerous times for the same. She has current and forthcoming publications on varied fields such as mothering, immigration, and labor politics. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, ma'am, to discuss intersectionality and other unseen factors of oppression. Yeah. My pleasure, my pleasure, Rishwet and Chetan. Thank you for having me, and it's uh, such a wonderful uh, project and endeavor. Uh, I'm excited and very happy to be part of it. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Sir. So we'll be starting with like a few, you know, general questions uh, about, sure. you know, about the discussion. So let's just start a discussion with one of the most basic things. Like, so like, uh, can, can can you please talk about like, uh, what what do we mean by feminism, or like, uh, can we talk about some misconceptions that people have around the centered around the word feminism. Right, right. Um, thanks for the question, Chetan. And I mean, this has been a burning question and very intriguing, um, making people uncomfortable all the time, uh, which I, and that's what that makes it in, uh, exciting to discuss. Um, like, what is feminism, right? And uh, uh, many a times, you know, we talk about, essentially when, with, with the history of feminist movement, with the history uh, of the evolution of feminism, uh, it has always been about, you know, giving equal rights uh, to women uh, as men have been given historically because women have been, you know, deprived and denied of certain basic amenities and rights. But um, when, you know, I've asked many of my students that uh, how does a feminist look like or what are the misconceptions? Um, and they've often told me that, you know, I, I interacted with my grandparents. I interacted with, you know, generations older than me. Uh, who, who believed in the agenda uh, of equal rights, but they hated being called a feminist. Um, they hated the tag of, uh, you know, being called or labeled a feminist. So we've always uh, sort of, you know, as, as a feminist myself and people who, uh, you know, belong, belong or believe in this philosophy, it, it believes in equal rights. Um, and if you look into the history, it has evolved, uh, evolved significantly. Uh, with the first wave, second wave, third wave feminist movement. Uh, initially, it was very Anglo-American, uh, very centered around white women's politics. Um, and later on with the third wave feminist movement, uh, I think which is also the crux of uh, today's discussion, intersectionality, uh, where the focus shifted to global south, uh, right? Uh, and not just women's issues, but also issues around gender, uh, which incorporates femininity and masculinity. And also gender conversation uh, with other master statuses like race, like caste, uh, like nationality, like religion, everything put together. Uh, so the inception of feminist movement or the inception of the idea of feminism has uh, transformed and changed its contours uh, much into the current uh, century and the current uh, you know time that we live in. Um, and that brings forward the misconception or why people are hesitant to call themselves feminists. Uh, it's it, it's this you know general idea that how how do you picture a feminist right somebody who's angry all the time you know not beautiful uh, not pretty enough uh, always a woman uh, a man hater uh, or maybe a lesbian doesn't shave uh, so the, these are the misconceptions uh, that that need to be decoded and debunked um, in order to realize. Uh, you know, that the praxis aspect of the feminist movement, that's where it started, how it wanted to make some grassroots level changes. Um, so in, in that sense of the term, I think uh, it's important to attack the misconceptions first and then sort of reinstate the gravity and reinstate uh, the logistics of the term uh, feminism. But yeah, initially it started with giving women equal rights and um, it, it's my take uh, as a theorist, it's my take as a scholar, but I feel that it's just not about women's issue currently. Uh, it's, 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 it's issues, you know, it's, it's based on issues around gender. Uh, I think that is very important, which incorporates masculinity, which incorporates femininity. And there are so many various ways in which femininities and masculinities 
uh, they are interacting with all these domains uh, and they cannot exist in vacuum you know when you're talking about gender it just cannot exist in vacuum uh, it has to have a very deep seated conversation uh, with nationality with race with socio economic class uh, with the economic structures of education um so i think we need to expand the definition as well as uh, attack the misconceptions that have long existed um you know uh, behind this term feminism so it's like a negation of negation kind of approach mm. yeah. that makes sense yeah but so on that point like you know how you're talking about race and socio economic status and all Uh, a discussion which has you know like gained traction in the recent past especially is privilege and um so why do you think acknowledging you know the whole concept of privilege is so important and how can we acknowledge our own privilege you know in certain situations like you know in a yes. way yeah yes yes absolutely i think uh, rishit you brought up a very valid point is is the notion of uh, you know privilege because um uh, what is masculine privilege right uh, what is a race privilege uh what is uh an ability physical ability privilege as opposed to disability like right? what is the caste privilege um and i, I think this entire discussion that there's a fact uh, uh, even with the covid-19 pandemic we realized that education and how that that also comes from standpoint of privilege like how you're accessing education mm-hmm. currently through a digital portal uh, or through digitality uh, the point of departure is uh, privilege uh, so Uh, how i define it is it, very much based on you know this this very theorist called peggy mackintosh she, she's an american activist scholar feminist as well who described privilege as this you know invisible knapsack so it's like a backpack okay so like a backpack uh, mostly military army people they carry it uh, it has all the basic essentials so uh, whenever you need it you can just pull out those essentials from the backpack and use it to your advantage Uh, but many a times you're just unaware uh, of the advantages that you have, um, and that's how privilege works. Okay, uh, that's how privilege works. Uh, wherein uh, you know you, you might say I worked hard to reach where we are, uh, or maybe you know you're filing an application to go abroad. Okay, for your higher education. Uh, let's take this as an example, and uh, you say that you know I worked really hard for my. um to get my pull up my cgpa uh, i have worked closely with professors who given me excellent recommendations i did brilliantly in my gre um i applied i researched all these schools and you know i applied uh, to work under these top notch professors who were nobel laureates or whatever and that's my achievement right i got to harvard i got to yale i got to cambridge uh, that's my achievement uh, but just think a few steps back and realize that you know where you come from how did you get admitted into this uh, how did you get some of the you know premier coaching exercises and i'm not saying you know that people who are coming maybe from a very remote village in uttar pradesh or west bengal um it won't achieve what you know somebody who is born into greater uh, wealth and good socio economic background can achieve or you know coming from middle class or upper middle class or upper class for that matter but it's difficult there are larger obstacles all right um the, the fact that you apply for gre it requires a substantial amount of money the fact that you apply for all these colleges abroad you you needed money for that who paid for that right uh, who paid for your uh, I, I, you know uh, tours of practices your gre practices all the time who bought you the books uh, you know uh, and how did you get come in contact with some of the premier faculty call uh, faculty members uh, in the indian academic community uh, how did you get into this in the first place so the point of departure and nobody is negating your hard work that you have invested but the point of departure somewhere uh, is the privilege that you are born into the privilege that you use and accumulate in the process so the social location that you are inhabiting uh, is is not something just exclusively out of your own making uh, but there are several other forces as well like the socio economic class family that you're born into and the social and the cultural capital that you have okay the fact that you're able to speak fluent english that's a cultural capital okay uh, that is probably giving you an added advantage than somebody who's not that fluent in english right uh, so that form of cultural capital that is given to certain privileges in society uh, which might put you in the lead ahead might not as well it's, it's again how you make use of it but it might there's a greater possibility that you'll be ahead of the race 
uh, as compared to someone who is not born into these privileges or did not get access easily, right, the way some of us have. So I think that, that's a very important um, realization um, to sort of understand where we stand in society. Right. So we just talked about uh, privilege and how, how an invisible knapsack of sorts uh, primes you for, uh, gives you all the essentials for success later in life, right? So now let's talk about like the opposite side of the spectrum. So let's talk about intersectionality. So can we talk about like what is intersectionality basically and like how, why is it important for us to discuss it in a global context? Right, right, yes. So intersectionality is it's actually one of my favorite, uh, you know, sort of uh, theoretical uh, standpoint, uh, which was coined by someone called Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, who is a lawyer by profession and, you know, works in anti sort of race discrimination. Uh, and currently, I think it's in Colombia Law School. I'm not sure. We have to check up her uh, background. Uh, but uh, she coined the term intersectionality, uh, which, which oftentimes she does not refer to as a theory per se, uh, but rather a lens or a prism through which you can see the world around you. And it's the simultaneity. You know, it's like an intersection. So where, you know, maybe crossroads, where a lot of roads are coming and meeting. Uh, so it's the, it's the simultaneity of these various identities that we have, um, like gender, like race, like sexuality, like religion, like physical ability or disability, uh, like nationality, uh, caste, uh, all of these coming together, um, and the cumulative effect that comes out of it, okay? So the fact that you cannot be holistically called privileged or holistically called oppressed, on certain counts um, is, is the whole paradigm of intersectionality, which comes in to complicate the idea of privilege. Okay, so if we are thinking about, say, for example, uh, an upper caste Hindu man, okay, uh, who is straight, um, relatively from middle class, um, but is on a wheelchair. Right? So we see these components of privilege. For example, he's upper caste, he's Hindu, um, and he's straight which means heterosexual, uh, and the fact that, you know, he, he's middle class, okay, you know, relatively he's getting all the privileges and access to resources, but again, he's on a deal check, right? So on certain level, he is attaining privilege in, in, in everyday life because of the caste card or the, the class card uh, or, you know, the socioeconomic, uh, you know, sort of uh, sex, sexuality card. Uh, but when it comes to an able-bodied society, uh, we see that he is on a wheelchair. So that complicates or that adds a layer uh, to his set of experiences and defines the social location. And that's the beauty of intersectionality, where you're bringing in all these layers of analysis, where you're bringing in all these factors together. Uh, and it's like a Venn diagram. Okay? It's like a Venn diagram where you have, you know, three or four, or you can add as many circles as you want. And you always, we as individuals always fall somewhere at that intersection, okay? And you can keep adding the circles, one can be race, one can be caste, one can be gender, one can be sexuality, one can be nationality, religion, whatever. And all of them have an impact. All of them have a conversation uh, when it comes together to define your holistic social location, okay? Because on some level you will be privileged, on some level you will be oppressed. Some might weigh more than the others, okay? Factors of oppression, the fact that he's on, an, on a wheelchair might weigh more than the fact that he's upper caste Hindu man. Um, so on those levels, he might be you know, not so privileged as compared to someone uh, who might be Dalit but is not on a wheelchair. So in, in that sense of the term, it impacts the identity of the individual. And when we are talking about identity, uh, it's the meaning that is associated uh, with each, each category I just mentioned, you know, what, what does it mean to be on a wheelchair? It has a social meaning, right? It, incapacit it, it incapacitates you because we live in an able-bodied society. Uh, in order to access a bank, in order to access uh, a particular uh, you know, school or college, uh, he has to work harder. Okay? He has to work harder. So in that sense of the term, it complicates the notion of, intersectionality complicates the notion uh, of uh, you know, privilege, uh, and it also emanated from the politics of race, uh, because with Patricia Hill Collins coming in with black feminist thought, um, she tried to say that, you know, we have to analyze the position of African-American women 
because it, it, it is exclusively not a gender component, but there's also race, yeah. right? So race and gender, they come together to define the social location of African-American women. Uh, so that becomes very important in, in our analysis and in our everyday understanding of, you know, daily situations and identity. Right, right. So transitioning from uh, intersectionality, let's talk about a curious case in, in, uh, in that itself. So especially when we talk about brown women in, in a global north context, like of course, when we talk about global north, we mean like technically and socially well-developed countries. So mm -hmm. how would uh, how, what would you say uh, about the position of brown women in a global north context? Um, it's a very interesting idea because, you know, with the third wave feminist movement, uh, this, this, this whole paradigm of shifting focus uh, to brown women politics, uh, the politics of brown women kind of, you know, came out, came about. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the works of, say, you know, the, the famous scholar like Chandra Talpati Mohanty, and I'm sorry if I'm bringing scholarly work, uh, but I, I just use it as a way to sort of enable us in terms of easier understanding. Um, where she's describing her position, it's a very simple story. That's why I'm using it. It's not, really, not, not so much of a theory as you theorize it later. Uh, but she's using her example as uh, a brown woman uh, growing up in uh, the suburb, you know, growing up in urban Mumbai, uh, getting her degree from there, uh, coming from a relatively, you know, middle class, upper middle class family, um, getting the right kind of education that is expected, private schools, then college, you know, higher ed. Um, and then she moves to uh, US for her PhD, okay, uh, I think Illinois, mm -hmm. Urbana Champaign. Um, and, and she says that, um, you know, uh, the moment I moved to the US, um, a new category was added to, to my identity, uh, which was that of race. Okay? So it's like this sticky note which is stuck to your forehead. Uh, and it's not something uh, that you uh, understand your identity being that of, you know, race or, or race, race, but also what others are perceiving you or what is the perception around a brown woman, what it means to be a brown woman, all right? And she says that when I was back in India, I was enjoying few privileges because, you know, I come from a higher socioeconomic class category. Uh, I, I uh, you know, got the right kind of education. I grew up in urban Mumbai. Um, and uh, I, caste, caste was in my favor. So I had a lot of privileges, uh, maybe discounted on some level because of my gender. But the moment I moved to U.S. or migrated to U.S., this new sort of, you know, post-it was added on my forehead, which was race. Um, and people started perceiving me, and race did not exist as a category when she was back in India. So uh, that perception changed. That what it means to be a brown woman? Does it mean you're submissive? Uh, you know, you can be dominated. Um, you have a legacy of being subjugated by patriarchy, and therefore you do not have the ability to voice your own opinion. Um, and these are some of the conceptions or misconceptions or stereotypes that automatically bounce forward uh, when you imagine a brown woman. Uh, so even today in the, in the current day context, if you're looking at the Afghan crisis, right, the Afghanistan crisis, uh, you can see that uh, it's a humanitarian crisis nonetheless. Um, but everybody is talking globally about the position of women in Afghanistan. And that is something which has been the highlight. Uh, because of Taliban's legacy of subjugating women, uh, depriving of the basic rights of education, uh, legislative representation, uh, ability to work and be employed, legally employed, gainfully employed, um, and just the dignity of a human being, the basic, the basic rights of a human being, uh, they've been historically denied under Taliban legacy uh, to women. So that becomes the core idea, uh, you know, and uh, how, how that changes. Uh, that, 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 that the whole understanding of brown woman um, also becomes very stereotypical, all right? Uh, so if you're, if you're going abroad, okay, as a brown woman, there are certain stereotypes that get attached, okay? People do not take into consideration your individual situa situation, how you've grown up, the kind of privileges that you have, uh, you know, received, uh, or how much awareness you have about global politics, how much awareness you have about global education, things like that. So in that sense of the term, uh, I think the whole feminist movement or the whole paradigm of intersectionality um, is, is a way to understand these, uh, you know, granularity 
of individual positions. Uh, and I use this example very often that, you know, how, how you might be experiencing democracy in India or how I might be experiencing democracy in India, a Dalit woman's experience of democracy in India would be very, very different, yeah. right? So it's, it's this matrix of domination. Uh, it's, it's this very granular understanding of how these individual uh, fragments of that comprise of who we are, uh, that comprise of our identity, create an everlasting impact on the ancestral resources, uh, the basic amenities of livelihood. And I think uh, the conceptualization of brown woman in that sense of the term uh, is, is also very, very important when we're looking at the global north, because they have this misconception that brown woman means that you've been deprived of certain rights historically, which might not be the case, okay? Yeah. Which might be the case as well. But it's, but it's important to break uh, this idea. That's where the survey feminist movement came in, because they said that all this while you've been talking about white middle class women's problems, which are very different from the brown woman's problems, from the women in the global south, from men in global south. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, in that sense of the term, uh, there are certain misconceptions that get centered uh, around certain portrayals. Um, and there are misconceptions about everything, you know, for example, religion and regionality or whatever. Uh, but I think the understanding of brown woman, even brown man for that matter, uh, how you're perceived and how you lose your privileges the moment you sort of migrate uh, mm. to any of the Anglo-American countries or the countries of the global north that you're strip searched at any airport um, much more than a white man would be. Uh, and that kind of counts as a way that you're losing your privileges on some level uh, as compared to a white man. So I think, yeah, so that's the way intersectionality Okay. Yeah, that. Thank you so much for that, man. Because that was like, you know, it added a whole like dimension to the whole intersectionality debate. You know, how privilege can change from place to place, and that was very informative. Thank you. But so moving on to the next part of the discussion, uh, a very you know commonly talked about topic, especially in like colleges among students, is you know affirmative actions which certain companies take, especially for women. You know, in terms of hiring and stuff. And this is a very you know like broadly discussed topic, but often people don't see the entire picture or the scenario which is you know which exists in the world. So on that, what do you think are some of the more unseen factors of oppression in the workplace and the labor market, you know, that generally like go unacknowledged, like by right. students when they, you know, indulge in discussions such as these? Yeah. Right, right. Absolutely. Thanks for the question, Vishit. Um, I feel that uh, when we are talking about workplace politics and, uh, you know, uh, when we're talking about affirmative action um, and the, the fulfillment of, pre, you know, kind of uh, filling in certain quotas or categories. Um, and in that sense of the term, uh, the important concept that comes in is diversity. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's, it's the idea of diversity, uh, which might be fulfilled, okay, in organizations and workspaces. Uh, but does diversity always mean inclusivity? Okay. And by inclusivity, I mean that equal representation in terms of voicing opinion and validating those opinions through policy changes, through execution on, you know, on, a, on an everyday basis. All right. So diversity always might not translate into inclusivity. Uh, that is something uh, that, that is where the lacuna is. That is where the gap is. Uh, which I think many of us experience, uh, not just women, but, but minorities in general. Uh, experience uh, this, this position uh, where they are being recruited, um, they are being you know present in an organization, but they're not being heard. Yeah. Okay. So in, in that sense of the term, uh, there are you know plenty of studies as well which is, which is going on. Uh, uh, for example, you know this, this very important body of work uh, by Joan Acker, uh, where she defines the workplace. You know, and she's saying that. Um, how, how do we understand productivity in the current sense of the term, okay, in the current context? It's a very capitalist outcome uh, of understanding that how an individual is productive uh, or this image of the ideal worker okay, in the current economy, like somebody who is working for endless number of hours in the office, uh, somebody who does not, is not displaying emotions in the workspace, uh, somebody who's keeping their personal uh, or private life away from their public life, right? Uh, and, you know, somebody who's not engaging in, in too much, as I said, you know, interpersonal relationship within the workspace. And 
somebody who checks out these boxes uh, most automatically falls into the category of being a straight man, right? Uh, who, you know, kind of, uh, you know, probably does not have enough child care responsibility to take care of a kid back at home or an elderly because care work historically has been theorized and has been uh, statistically proven uh, to be feminized uh, globally, not just in the Indian context, but globally. So the characterization of the ideal worker in this current economy is someone who is working for lengthy hours, okay? Uh, and I'm not saying that women do not check into that box, but you have to look into the fact that what kind of women are we really talking about? Women who are probably not married, uh, women who are married but do not have children, right? Uh, so there, there comes in this idea of a mommy tax, uh, wherein uh, you know scholars are saying that with one kid being born, women take a hit in their career or their overall earning, which is over than a million dollars. Uh, when, when the second kid is born, it's an even bigger hit, bigger hit. And the tax or the compensation that you pay for being a mother, all right, uh, whether in terms of uh, quitting the workforce or in terms of going to a part-time labor or doing temp work, whatever it is, right, there is a payment going from the side of the mother to society, to the economy, right? Mm -hmm. So there are certain hidden factors which are not documented in policy, which are not documented anywhere else. Uh, which keeps happening, all right? So, for example, we did this study uh, in, in uh, uh, you know, in uh, science academia, uh, in higher higher education, in um, certain universities in Uttar Pradesh, okay? Uh, and there we interviewed um, faculty members uh, from the natural sciences, men and women combined, and there was this apparent facade. So, even that, that is something that John Acker is saying, this facade of gender neutrality, all right? that there is no discrimination based on gender. But there's something that's going on which makes women earn much less than men do, even on the same job, all right? Uh, or get less benefits than their male counterparts. So while we were doing this study, we were interviewing men and women both. Uh, and many times, you know, men said that, um, men assistants and associates and senior professors, they said that he has an equalitarian system uh, and we have, uh, you know, uh, pork for, or you get, we get promoted if you're going to foreign conferences, uh, you are participating in, um, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, laboratory work, you're staying office hour, after office hours to socialize with people. Um, these are gender neutral categories, okay? Because it has nothing to say that, you know, if you're a woman, you won't be promoted, or if you're a man, you will, you will be promoted. It's not that apparent. Okay. As we're unpacking this, uh, we see uh, that women who have younger children are probably unable to go for international conferences, travel so much, right? So for somebody to take care of home, uh, maybe an elderly parent or young kids or kids in general of any age, uh, they cannot stay back longer hours in the lab okay, to run an experiment. They have to go back home. Most commonly, these are women. All right. I'm not saying they're men. That there aren't men who are doing it, but I'm saying they're mostly, we're looking into the averages, okay, the overall figures. Mostly they were women, right? So nowhere is it written that women cannot, be, you know, women won't be promoted. But you have to fulfill these criteria of being the ideal worker, which many a time women are unable to perform or unable to fulfill because they have certain other responsibilities which do not get calibrated or accounted within the workspace politics or within the you know, institutional structures in terms of policy making. All right. So in that sense of the term, these are some of the invisible factors, okay, which contribute significantly, uh, but are not factored in, which are not accounted for uh, when we are looking into the overall growth and progress uh, of genders. So therefore, going back to the idea of affirmative action, the basis is that of equity, not just equality. So that is something which we always have to remember, that we are giving more to communities, we are giving more to individuals, but it's historically deprived, as opposed to equality, which is just a random equal distribution of resources and facilities to everyone, irrespective of their historical background. Okay? It doesn't make sense. If somebody is not hungry, you're giving them more food, as somebody who has been starving for a very long time and giving them that equal amount of food. Right? Mm -hmm. So it does not make sense. So 
the, the, the debate should be around equity all the time and not just plain and simple equality. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and just a smaller point on the same thing. What are some factors that, you know, in the first place, prevent women from entering the workforce? Like, not just, the, you know, like pay gap and everything, but like, you know, women like tend to have, like, you know, as at, at, at large in workplaces, there tends to be a majority of men for some reason. So like, there's something that is stopping women from entering the labor market. And, you know, what is that? Yes, yes. Um, I think when we're looking into workspace politics and, uh, you know, ideally talking about sex segregated occupations in that sense of the term, where women are entering, um, uh, but, for example, if you're, you know, looking into the current uh, Fortune 500 company report, mm -hmm. how many CEOs are there? Um, it's been a, a significant rise from the past year. Currently, there are about 41 uh, female CEOs uh, among the Fortune 500 companies, but still it's less yeah. as, as much as we, we would hope for. Um, so there's something going on. Um, and it boils down to a lot of micro factors, okay, whether it is, you know, socialization uh, or gender socialization, which happens, and how they tend to understand the patterns of masculinity and femininity. Uh, for example, being masculine means aggressive, predominantly, okay? Because we are always kind of dividing the world into binaries. Uh, we are trying to amplify the differences as opposed to uh, bring in the similarities, amplify the similarities, right? Uh, there are women who are aggressive, but we don't talk about them. Uh, we talk about, or we talk about those traits as being masculine traits, right? Mm -hmm. Even if women are aggressive. So, you know, masculinity is mostly defined as aggressive behavior, dominant behavior, practical, rational, decision makers, things like that, as opposed to femininity, which is mostly nurturing, submissive, uh, you know, uh, subservient, emotional, things like that. So when you map that in the workspace, you can see that which attributes are valued much more in the current day economic structures and which attributes get paid less or valued less uh, when you map that in the workplace politics. All right. Uh, so, so many a times, and there are certain other very granular um, uh, challenges as well. Uh, for example, travel. Right. There have been plenty of studies which say that uh, women cannot stay after hours in the workspace uh, because they have to travel long distances back to their hostel or PG or home. Right. And it's not safe to travel in public transport. Many corporations do not have facilities to drop the kids, uh, you know, drop the, their workers, female workers back to their workplaces. So they cannot take jobs which are further away from their house mm -hmm. because the travel, they want to cut down on the travel time. Okay. So these are certain granular problems that need to be addressed. Is it safe to ride a cab in the night? Okay. Is it safe to walk back with a coworker? All right. Uh, so these are certain, certain factors also, uh, which play a very important role. Um, and also, you know, this, this whole idea of gender socialization, um, this, this whole idea that, you know, the idea of, say, maternity leave, okay? Uh, we don't have a paternity leave currently structured okay. for government institutions. It's just 15 days. 15 days is nothing, yeah. right? Yeah. Paternity leave. And maternity leave is like six months or so, which has been increased recently. I think in 2017 or some 2016, it got uh, increased to six months. Um, so... It says that nobody can be fired in that period. But again, the mommy tax kicks in because once the woman is back in the workforce, there's been a gap. Okay, there's been a gap. And the institutional structures are not empathetic enough to accommodate that individual. And that gets calibrated in the overall production, you know, overall productivity uh, or overall performance uh, of the worker. Okay. Uh, it does not mean that the worker is unable to work any, 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 anymore. There just has to be some institutional changes and flexibility, maybe a daycare in the workspace, right, which can ease the problem, maybe a little bit of consideration uh, from the institutional structure to understand what postpartum depression might look like, okay, having a counselor in place to deal with these issues, all right. So certain changes within the institution can actually accommodate this person who might be going through certain life-changing, um, you know, uh, system or life-changing experiences, which are, again, ironically uh, rewarded in society, right? Mm -hmm. Imagine women who, you know, are pressurized constantly to be mothers and who are not mothers, right? So, mm -hmm. so one way they're being rewarded, one way they're being uh, sort of ostracized or being punished or reprimanded uh, for the choice of having a kid. Uh, 
So in that sense of the term, there are, there are these factors um, and these characteristics uh, which, which are so much inbred and so much present um, yeah. in terms of determining the overall productivity uh, of the individual and also how we understand productivity in the current sense of the term. It's something which is highly debatable uh, and needs to be, you know, reworked around. Um, that's how we understand productivity. Because I think even with the COVID-19, the, the entire paradigm of productivity has changed, um, and it's a new world altogether. So, yeah. Wait, so the last point you brought up, you know, is very interestingly our last question as well, COVID-19, mm -hmm. you know, so currently, you know, post pandemic, or, you know, not even post pandemic yet, during the pandemic, what do you think are some impacts that COVID, the COVID-19 crisis had on gender discrimination, especially for working women, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, right, yeah. right, right. Again, you know, Richard, thanks for bringing up the question. And also, I want to acknowledge the fact that whatever I'm going to say, um, it goes back to the first question that you raised about privilege, okay, or the second question that you raised about privilege, uh, because we're talking about working professionals um, and working women, uh, and the, the range of diversity of working women uh, is, 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 is quite enormous, because we are looking at, say, uh, the buyer who comes to work in your house is also a working woman, yeah. uh, as opposed to a CEO who is also a working woman. Right. Uh, so in that sense of the term, the, the spectrum is huge and how these, these two individuals in both the ends of the spectrum have bore the brunt uh, of uh, you know, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and there are several studies, for example, you know, the McKenzie report uh, of gender equality of 2020 in documents uh, or gender equality report of 2020 documents that uh, women have uh, or women are the rate at which women are losing jobs or might lose jobs in the next couple of years because of the COVID-19 pandemic is 1.8 times higher than uh, the rate at which men might be losing jobs, right? And what are the reasons behind that? There are several reasons behind that, which I think ties into the previous responses uh, that I had given. Um, and this, this, this whole shift of, you know, work from home uh, paradigm, right? Uh, so you're working from home, uh, wherein previously the private space and the public space were very much separate from each other. But right now it has just kind of, you know, overlapped. It's, yeah. it's this one space in which uh, people are working, people are doing their homework, food is getting cooked, house is getting cleaned, uh, people are taking naps, uh, playing around, throwing things, uh, whatever. Um, so everything is happening within one kind of compressed space, uh, which, which has changed the way we are working, um, the way productivity is, but the expectation of productivity has not changed. All right. Yeah. The yeah. way you're supposed to perform, the way you're supposed to produce, that paradigm has not changed. As long as you're alive, you're working. Right. Yeah. Uh, it does not take into consideration if there's been a death in the family because of COVID-19. Oh, you know, if there's different compensation, that's fine. You know, but, but the deadline is there. You know, the deadline is here at the end of the week. You've got to get going. And how that impacted disproportionately women as opposed to men is something which is very, very important to analyze and speculate because, you know, say, say women, uh, it goes back to the idea of the second shift uh, by Ari Hochschild, uh, where it was this revolutionary concept. And again, I don't want to bore you with theories, but I just want to tell you a story again. Uh, wherein the, the second shift was something in the 1980s, she's talking about in US particularly, uh, the problem that working women are facing, uh, where they are performing two shifts, okay? One is the paid shift, which is outside of the household space. And the second is the unpaid shift, which, which is the reproductive labor, which is the household chores that is per she's performing within the household space, within the intimate space of the household, for which she's not getting paid. Now imagine both happening within the same physical space, all right? That creates a chaos where the woman, you know, has to, take online classes, you know, take care of a kid, uh, you know, do, do the dishes uh, as well as, you know, cook food, etc. Uh, and with, therefore, you know, this, this pandemic, um, uh, there, there's been a lot of issues uh, which has led to women quitting, okay, women, women losing their jobs either by choice or also because they are not able to meet the demands of being productive, the ideal worker. Okay, for which they might have been fired, right? For some excuse that you've not been able to meet the deadline. So again, you know, there's still a facade of gender neutrality, 
the fact that this individual was unable to meet the deadline or unable to meet the target, therefore this person was fired. But are you looking into the background factors? Are you looking into the latent forces that inhibit uh, this individual to perform the way you have set your performance or productivity standard, right? So this invisibility or the invisible labor uh, has created an impact uh, on women losing jobs during the COVID-19 pandemic, it has also led to enormous amounts of psychological stress and psychological, uh, you know, issues and mental health issues have become a core topic uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, also, you know, women, especially domestic laborers who have lost their jobs uh, because, you know, families switched not to keep them because, you know, we are doing our own work. Why do we need, uh, you know, why do we need to pay them? Uh, and, you know, keep them going, uh, let them not work for us. So many of them have lost their jobs as well. Uh, when we are looking into lower socioeconomic uh, groups of women uh, who do not have a support system, who do not have proper legislatures to defend their rights, um, et cetera. So, in this, it, so there are several factors uh, which have been amplified uh, in the COVID-19, uh, you know, uh, pandemic, as we can see. Uh, wherein, you know, it, 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 uh, it, there's been a lot of pregnant women who could not take the vaccine um, and, uh, you know, probably scared to step out of the house and go and work, all right? That, 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 that might be one of the factors uh, why women have to quit the workforce. Uh, so all these issues, all the problems, I feel, that were embedded, that were invisible in society, I hope, with the pandemic, uh, as much as we are dealing and tackling to reduce it, we evolve as a better society, you know, we evolve as a better society by acknowledging the disadvantages uh, that often remain hidden and it's not just about gender, uh, it, it, it's also about a lot of other factors like socioeconomic class. For example, you know, the way we've been able to, or somebody from a higher socioeconomic class has been able to access healthcare, uh, many people have not. So as I said, you know, the point of departure was privilege because work from home is also a privilege that many people in this country would not have been able to avail, right? Uh, so in that sense of the term, uh, you know, it's very important to acknowledge the multiplicity of identities that we inhabit. So going back to the idea of intersectionality, we are thinking about, say, with the Hatras Lake incident. Yeah, right. Uh, it, it, it was just not a gender issue. It was, it was a caste issue. It was a socioeconomic class issue, uh, where the parents were denied the right uh, of, of uh, you know, cremating their kids or going in for further forensic investigation uh, and, and the blatant disrespect to justice, okay? So how did that come about? It was just not a gender issue. It was a caste issue. It was a socioeconomic class issue. So going back to the paradigm of intersectionality, I think it was laid out, uh, you know, in greater magnitude than the COVID-19 pandemic with the migrant labor crisis and various other, uh, you know, uh, incidents that we've seen being thrown up in our faces, um, and also the gender factor uh, of women losing jobs uh, or women taking a lower, uh, you know, pay, low paying job because they can accommodate more time at home or because it's just impossible to work from home. Uh, you know, they don't have that kind of an infrastructure uh, in that sense of the term. So I think uh, we evolve as a better society, uh, acknowledging these disabilities, acknowledging these issues. Uh, that have put us behind and can move forward towards a more equitarian society, not an equalitarian society, but an equitarian society. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's that's a lot, you know, like that's a lot of information which like society we as a whole need to discuss and are often mm -hmm. not. So yeah. Right. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Right. So with that I'm afraid we have to uh, we are coming to the end end of the session and like uh, obviously, it was such an informative session, and uh, you you provided some very you know, valuable, uh, insight, insightful uh, examples and contexts, which would have wouldn't have uh, been realized otherwise. So, th thanks a lot for taking taking time out of your busy day to uh, have this session with us. So, just a few. Thank you so to... much. Right, right. Thank you so much for having me and you know giving me this uh, space uh, to discuss these issues because th these are something uh, that I just don't practice as an academic. Uh, but also I'm passionate about as an individual. And I think it boils down to us as an individual uh, so that we can make and rectify the problem. And as, as I said, you know, evolve as a better society. That is the, always the goal. And I think it starts with discussion. It starts with these amazing talk series uh, mm -hmm. that all of you are organizing uh, yeah. and, you know, bringing in people from all walks of life. Uh, I think uh, all the best to you and more power to you. 
Uh, good luck to all your future projects as well. Uh, and again, thank you. thank you for having me. It was lovely chatting with both of you. I wish you all the best. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. So.